2020, the Alabama Republican Senatorial Primary Debate. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Lisa Crane, and we're live at WVTM 13 Studios atop Red Mountain in Birmingham. Tonight, a one hour debate between four Republican senatorial candidates in advance of the primary election on Super Tuesday. Please welcome from left to right, businessman Stanley Adair, U.S. Representative for Alabama's 1st Congressional District, Bradley Byrne, former Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court, Roy Moore, and State Representative Arnold Mooney. Former Attorney General Jeff Sessions and Tommy Tuberville declined our offer to debate tonight. Now, here are the rules for the debate. Candidates have up to 60 seconds to answer questions specifically directed to them. They have 45 seconds to answer a question posed to all the candidates. The candidates will be granted a 30 second rebuttal at the moderator's discretion. At the end of the debate, each candidate will have 30 seconds to ask one of their opponents a question. 60 seconds will be allowed for the answer and 30 seconds for rebuttal. We're going to wrap up with one minute for each candidate's closing statement. The candidates have not seen the questions they're going to be asked tonight. On tonight's debate panel from left to right, WVTM 13's Ian Wrights, journalist Cheryl Stewart, and WVTM 13's Guy Rawlings. The first question in tonight's debate comes from WVTM 13's Ian Wrights. His question is for all four candidates. Ian? Good evening. So if you head to the Senate, what are the top two areas you would focus on to directly improve the lives of people here in Alabama? Councilman Byrne, you answer first. You have 45 seconds. Well, one of the first issues I think we need to deal with in Washington for people across America and for people in Alabama is immigration. It's a major problem for this country, and it's a problem right here in Alabama. I'm totally opposed to amnesty. The vast majority of people are opposed to amnesty in Alabama. Now, if I'm going to pick a second one, it'd be this. We've got to do something about the cost of health care and access to health care for people in rural Alabama. If we don't solve that problem, we're leaving people behind. Mr. Adair, now to you, 45 seconds. Yes, I as well believe that immigration is a big problem, but uh, I like to address health care because health care, and especially in Alabama here, we have a lot of rural communities that don't have adequate health care access. So we need to make sure that we uh, get about the business of bringing more health care to the rural areas. But also, you know, we do have a problem along our southern border, and I do support our president in building the wall and finishing the wall. And, and keeping the illegals that are doing harm in America out. So uh, that, that, those two issues not only affect Alabama, but they do affect uh, the entire country. Judge Moore, now to you, you have 45 seconds. One of the biggest issues facing our country is morality, a lack thereof because we've distanced ourselves from God. Uh, we've taken him out of our schools, we've taken him out of our courts, we've taken him out of our lives. And virtue and morality is a necessary spring of popular government, as according to our founding fathers. If I had another, I think it would be the indebtedness. Indebtedness is killing this country. Washington said in his farewell address that we should cherish public credit and use it as sparingly as possible. We've not done that. Uh, we're going to suffer the consequences, just like Argentina and other countries that have gone that way. Uh, we've got to look at how much we spend. Now, the question to Representative Mooney, you have 45 seconds. Immigration and health care are two great issues that face us that affect our state. They're linchpin together with debt. Immigration is our security, the security at our borders, the ability for us to be a nation that's sovereign. Health care, the relationship between a doctor and a patient, direct access to doctors not through intermediaries with the government or anyone else. But debt is the linchpin of both of these because with the debt we've got, it's going to destroy us and we won't be able to deal with these problems unless we address it. All right, the next question is for all the candidates. It comes from journalist Cheryl Stewart. Cheryl. The proposed Green Deal died in the Senate last year. Its goal was to lay out a plan tackling climate change over the next decade and protect vulnerable communities. Do you believe in climate change? And if so, what should the federal government be doing right now to address its effects? We're going to begin with Mr. Adair. You have 45 seconds. Well, I, I'm not a fan of the, the new Green Deal, as she's talking about. Uh, you know, we pulled out of the Paris Court of Agreement, Trump did, and I was, uh, I, I was glad we did that. You know, we can't go it alone as America. You know, we can't pay all of the, the things that are associated with climate change. And I, I believe that. We do have scientific proof that saying something's changing, 
but I do not necessarily believe that uh, we have all the answers for it right now. You know, we, we can pay carbon tax and all of that, but uh, it's, it's just another tax. It's just more money, you know. We, we need to change some of the things that we're doing, that's for sure. But we do have clean coal plants now, and uh, so I, I'm glad of some of the things that we're doing. Mr. Moore, now to you, 45 seconds. I'm completely against the Green Deal. I'm glad we pulled out of the Paris Accord. I think that this is a way to take down our country. I think it's, it's a democratic uh, proposition, but more than all of that, we're a government of restricted powers. Uh, the Tenth Amendment was very plain in saying that certain powers did not belong to the federal government, and I think clearly one of them is dealing with our atmosphere and our weather. And I think that this is something that is completely uh, expensive to our country, it's taking our money, it's hurting our country, and I don't believe in, in that. Uh, at all. All right, now to you, Mr. Mooney. You have 45 seconds. Climate change, climate cooling, climate warming. I don't know which one it might be. I've heard all of them. I hear that scientists say this, scientists say that. But, you know, historically, obviously, we've had changes in the climate of our world all through the history of our world. I don't believe in the religion of climate change at all. I believe sincerely that we should be paying attention to how can we make our nation better in every way that we can. We need to be paying great attention to making everything more efficient, more successful, and uh, more useful. But no, I don't agree with the concept of the Green New Deal or climate change at this point. Now to Mr. Byrne, 45 seconds. The Green New Deal is a joke. There is no way in the world we can accomplish what they're trying to do there. America has become energy independent by developing all of our forms of energy. That wasn't true even just a few years ago. Why would we throw off something that's a strength for our country and weaken our country when the rest of the countries around the world aren't doing that at all? So I say let's stick to the strength of this country. There are common sense things we can do to make sure we keep our environment clean and friendly, but the Green New Deal isn't one of them. Now let's go to WDTM 13's Guy Rawlings for our next question. This is for all four candidates. Guy? We've had seven officers killed in Alabama in a little over a year by guns. Guns that shouldn't have been in the hands of the people who used them. What are your suggestions to fight gun violence? Tom, we're going to begin with you, Judge Moore. You have 45 seconds. I think we need more guns. I can see it in the, the Texas uh, recent massacre. There was attempted massacre in a church down there. Guns don't kill people. I don't know why we can't get through to people about this. It's people that kill people. It's human nature. We've got to bring God back into our schools. We've got to bring morality back. And certainly guns are just a, an element that's used to take lives. This could be cars, this could be knives, it could be anything. Uh, certainly this uh, effort by the government to take our guns is against the Second Amendment. And that's something I strongly adhere to and think that we should uphold. Representative Mooney, you have 45 seconds. The situation we have in our country with trying to deal with violence is one that deals with mental illness, with people who are criminals, and guns need to be kept out of the hands of people who are criminals and people who are mentally ill. But we don't solve those problems by taking away Second Amendment rights that are precious and dear to protect our families and our homes. We've got to pay attention to doing those things that are necessary to have good legislation that deals with the criminals. As guns just don't kill people. Knives don't kill people. People kill people. The solution to all of this is really coming back to knowing what good values are and embracing them and not the values of violence and destruction. Now to you, Congressman Byrne, 45 seconds. Every one of these deaths is a tragedy. But we shouldn't compound that tragedy by taking away people's rights that they have under the Second Amendment to the Constitution. There are things that we should do to stop this violence. One of them is to give greater attention to mental health, because many of these people do have mental problems. But there is crime rampant in certain parts of our state, in certain parts of our country. And we have to deal with that crime, which means we have to stand behind the men and women in blue who put their lives on the line every day for us. Let's support them as they protect us. 45 seconds now to you, Mr. Adair. Well, you know, 
This is a serious problem, gun violence is, and I believe Alabama ranks with one of the highest uh, gun violent death rates in all of the states, uh, right here where we're at tonight. And uh, it's a serious problem. I don't believe in that we need new gun laws. We don't, we don't need any more gun laws. We need to, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, we need to enforce the ones we've got. You know, we have too many laws and regulations now, and it's not guns that do the killing, it's people. And we can contribute this to mental health. You know, we do have a, a large mental health uh, issue in all the states, and we need to address those things, but we certainly don't need any more gun laws opposed on law-abiding citizens. All right, let's get back to the panel now, and our next question from WVTM 13's Ian Wright. Ian? In the last decade, six rural hospitals here in Alabama have closed according to the Charter Center for Rural Health. They also list 27% of Alabama's rural hospitals as most vulnerable to closing and 38% as vulnerable. So you look at those figures and you consider the state has not expanded Medicaid. What do you do at the federal level to ensure that all Alabamians have access to quality health care? We begin with Representative Mooney. You have 45 seconds. We need to have cross-state competition for health care in relation to insurance. If you can buy your insurance for your automobile from anywhere in the country, it makes only good common sense that you could buy your health care insurance that way. Direct patient access for primary care, the relationship between a patient and a doctor, it shouldn't be interfered with by the government or any third party. It's not patient insurance doctor or patient government doctor. It should be straightforward between the doctor and the patient. That's health care freedom. That's what it's about. To solve access problems and everything else, we've got to reach a point of competing positively across state lines and opening up the opportunity for health care. Now to Congressman Byrne, 45 seconds. Rural health care is extremely important. Any hospital closing in this state is a tragedy, but a rural hospital closing is a particular one. Six years ago, when I first got to Congress, I was asked by the Alabama Hospital Association to find a solution to the problem that Alabama hospitals were receiving 20% less than hospitals all over the country for taking care of Medicare patients, which is so important to rural hospitals. Working with President Trump's leadership at the Medicare office, we were able to get that fixed last October. And now our rural hospitals and other hospitals across Alabama are receiving millions of more dollars, which will keep them financially healthy so they keep us healthy. Now 45 seconds to you, Mr. Adair. Well, we need to come up with an initiative to keep rural health care uh, and keep hospitals thriving. And one of the things I, that I'm hearing across the state and around uh, this, these towns is the uh, reimbursement rates, you know, with uh, some of these doctors, they don't want to take certain uh, medic, uh, Medicaid and Medicare payments because uh, the reimbursement rates is not fast enough and one little thing holds it up. You know, we need to make sure that we streamline some of these things and even look at uh, telemedicine. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of big pharma, but telemedicine uh, could help uh, get some access to, to where rural communities don't have access to doctors. Telemarketing would be a good thing. All right, Judge Moore, now to you, 45 seconds. If I were running a state race, I would say that we need to invest more money in our hospitals and more money in our health care. And I am concerned about the lack of uh, treatment in rural communities, but we are running for the United States Senate. The 10th Amendment is very clear. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution or prohibited by it to the states or reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Health care is not one of those issues that belong to the federal government. Look what Obamacare has done to us. Look what anything that the federal government does, it, it just ruins us. And that's why we're having trouble. We should buy our health care from cross state lines. And it's restricted here in Alabama somewhat, uh, to a great deal, actually. We need to go back to the Constitution to resolve these problems. Next question now will be specifically directed to each candidate individually. Each candidate is going to have 60 seconds to respond. And we're going to begin with WVTM 13's Ian Wrights with a question for Mr. Moore. Ian. Judge Moore, weeks before you announced your Senate bid, President Trump tweeted that while he has nothing against you, Roy Moore cannot win. After losing the 2017 special election to a Democrat in a largely red state, how do you assure skeptical GOP voters that you can win this time around against the same opponent? Well, President Trump's under a lot of pressure, under pressure from people that could remove him from office, and he's being pushed by people in Congress. I can win. I got 650,000 votes in the last election, despite the fact that a Republican senator from this state by the name of Richard Shelby came on television and urged 20-something thousand people to write off the ballot to somebody else. I lost by less margin than that. 
this is a fiction that the, the Washington establishment has put out. They do not want me in Washington. They've done everything they could to keep me from going to Washington. And this is just one of the ploys. When the Republicans got with the Democrats in the last election and then decided to defeat my campaign, they did. But not until after 650,000 people voted for me. He won by a very slim margin. Doug Jones is going to be history after this this race. He is not going to be elected. Any of these Republican candidates can beat Doug Jones and will beat Doug Jones if they get in the primary. Journalist Cheryl Stewart now with a question for Representative Mooney. Cheryl? Representative Mooney, as a member of the Alabama legislature, can you give us an example of a bill on which you gained bipartisan support to successfully pass? There are a number of bills that uh, we have gained, I have gained, and uh, others have worked with me to gain bipartisan support. The Mothers Against Drunk Driving Interlock DUI Bill, we had vast bipartisan support for it. Uh, bipartisan support for a number of small business activities that we've done in relation to uh, working with preempting uh, labor activities that were going to be a problem in our state. We've been blessed to be able to compete uh, or to work together in the competition in relation to uh, the bond issues that were, we were facing uh, a number of years ago. We had a bipartisan process between both parties in defeating a $3 billion cost of bond issue. Bipartisanship relates to the issue. It relates to what's going on and the ability of people to come together to fight a common uh, issue that they're concerned about. I believe very strongly that that can be done. WVTM 13's Guy Rawlings now has a question for Congressman Bradley Byrne. Guy? Mr. Byrne, in a country getting more diverse every day, you ran an ad that says, I will not let them tear our country apart. How do you bring Alabama and the nation together after what that ad seemed to imply about minorities? That ad was about values for American people, no matter what their color is. My brother fought, as many other people in this country fought, in the uniform of the United States. And anytime any person disrespects our country because they won't stand up for the national anthem or they berate our country, they tear down and dishonor people like my brother. That's what that ad was about. The way you unify this country is to go back to our first and primary values. And there are people in Washington like the squad, who want to pull us away from those values. They want us to move to something where we've never been before and will take our country in a direction that we should never go. So I'm going to continue to stand up for those values and honor the men and women in our uniform. And they are of all colors, all religions. We should stand up for them and for the values that are American values that are anything to do with our color of our skin or our religion it has to do with who we are inside and who our country's been for almost 250 years. We now go to WVTM 13's Ian Wright. He has a question for Mr. Adair. Ian? Mr. Adair, according to the latest Federal Election Commission finance report, your campaign has raised a little more than $287,000 to date, far less than many of the other GOP candidates, and well below that of the $7.5 million that Democrat Doug Jones has raised. So considering those figures and lower poll numbers, how do you convince GOP voters that you're the best candidate to win in November? Well, that sure is a good question, you know, and, you know, I've, I've been telling people all across the state, you know, it's not about the money, folks, and if you follow the money, you'll find out that Washington is being sold out. I do have the smallest wallet of any of these folks up here as far as campaign finances, but let me say this. I care the values of the Alabama voters. That's what I intend to do. That's the reason I'm uh, canvassing this state and continue to stay in this race and canvass this state because it's about the voters. Look, far too long we've sent folks to Washington and they've sold us out. And they sold us out with special interest money. And that's the reason that, you know, we need campaign finance reform in a large way. Look, special interest groups is buying these uh, folks when they go to Washington. We've got senators that's worth $150 million and a job only pays $174,000 a year. Some Something's wrong with that kind of calculation. So, you know, I'm, I'm proud of what we had in this race, but it's not about the money. It's about educating the people on values that we took, take to Washington and represent the people. It's about the people of Alabama. All right, we're going to take a short break right now. We are live from WVTM 13 studios on top of Red Mountain for the Republican senatorial primary debate. <laughs> 